Welcome, Incor family. Welcome. My name is Dedrick Perkins, and thank you for joining the Setting Our Compass webinar series. I use any and all pronouns. I am the Senior Program Coordinator for the Southwest Center for Human Relations Studies at Depart a department of the University of Oklahoma Outreach and the home of the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity in Higher Education, NCORE, um, in Norman, Oklahoma. I am delighted to welcome you and to be your host this afternoon. As we set sail toward NCORE 2024 in Honolulu, we invite you to embark on the transformative journey with our seven-part Setting Our Compass webinar series. This series serves as your navigational guide, providing historical context and contemporary insights that will enrich your NCORE experience. Whether you're a seasoned conference attendee or a first-time explorer, these webinars will set the course for meaningful engagement, learning, growth, and connection. Today is part one of the series. All these webinars will be free of charge and available on our YouTube channel shortly after. Search for Incor on YouTube and like and subscribe to our channel. The next webinar is titled Development of the Pledge to Our Key and will be facilitated by Matt Lane and Keone Kialoha, where they will discuss how we can create a better future for the next generation. It will broadcast on Thursday, March 21st at 10 a.m. Hawaiian Standard Time, which is 3 p.m. Cent Central Standard Time. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. If you need to utilize closed captioning, make sure your settings are set to on. Always remain mute unless you are requested to unmute. We ask that your background has no moving images or flashing lights. And if you experience any type of specific tech, accessibility, or any other operational concerns via um, connect to me via direct message. Um, I am the session host. The presenter will take questions um, at the end of the presentation, so please feel free to use the Q&A box and we'll get through as many questions as we can with the time allotted. Our featured presenter today is Dr. David Keanu Sai. Dr. Keanu Sai is a political scientist and senior lecturer at the University of Hawaii Windward Community College, Departments of Political Science and Hawaiian Studies, and affiliate graduate faculty member at the University of Hawaii at Manoa College of Education. He also served as agent for the Hawaiian Kingdom at the Permanent Court of Arbitration, The Hague, Netherlands, and Larson v. Hawaiian Kingdom PCA case number 1999-01. Dr. Sai Dr. received his PhD and MA degrees in political science specializing in international relations and law from the University of Hawaii, Manoa. Today, Dr. Sai will be presenting on setting the record straight on Hawaii indigeneity. Help me welcome Dr. David Keanu Sai. Mahalo, Dieter. Uh, let me go straight to the share screen. Okay, so my presentation today is going to be, it's titled Setting the Record Straight on Hawaiian Indigeneity. Uh, the information that I'm presenting uh, stems from an article that I wrote that was published in Volume 3 of the Hawaiian Journal of Law and Politics. And uh, I believe Diedrich was able to put that in the uh, uh, chat room. So you can go ahead and download that uh, article. And after my presentation or after this webinar, I think... I would encourage you to go back and read read that article, as there's much more as there is much more information uh, there. So let's uh, let's begin. Now, what we have right now is a false narrative that concealed 131 years of the American occupation. In 1898, the Hawaiian Islands were incorporated into the territory of Hawaii. So, as if the history of Hawaii started in 1898. In 1946, the United States reported to the United Nations Secretary General that Hawaii was a colonial possession under its administration since 1898. A colonial possession is a territory that is not a country of their own. In 1959, the United States reported to the United Nations Secretary General that the people of Hawaii exercised their right of self-determination and chose to be the 50th state of the United States of America. Hawaii currently serves as headquarters for the Indo-Pacific Combatant Command 
of the Department of Defense with 118 military sites. This is pretty much the history that many people would know, right, or, or come to understand. But it's actually a false history. Now let's move into the Hawaiian indigeneity, okay, which stems from this false narrative. Well, there is an academic movement that I call Hawaiian indigeneity, whose premise is that the Hawaiian kingdom, a country in the 19th century, was controlled by the United States through its American missionaries and exploited and oppressed the native people of Hawaii. On the 1848 Great Mahele, dealing with land tenure in the 19th century, Professor Lilikala Kamele Hiva wrote, I refer to it simply as the 1848 Mahele because it proved to be such a terrible disaster for the Hawaiian people. And the word great has a connotation of superior. It was a tragic historical event, a turning point that had catastrophic negative consequences for Hawaiians. Professor John Osorio wrote that the Hawaiian kingdom never empowered the natives to materially improve their lives, to protect or extend their cultural values, nor even in the end, to protect that government from being discarded because the system itself was foreign and not Hawaiian. Professor Noi Noi Silva concluded that the overthrow was the culmination of 70 years of US missionary presence. And Dr. Robert Stauffer in his book, Kahana, How the Land Was Lost, he wrote, the government that was overthrown in 1893 had for much of its 50 year history been little more than a de facto unincorporated territory of the United States. And the kingdom's government was often American dominated, if not American run. The counter question, if the kingdom was controlled by the United States, why did they have to overthrow it in 1893? You don't overthrow something that you already are in control of. No, control may have occurred after 1893, but not before. So we have within the academic research hypothesis, which is a proposed explanation made on the basis of limited evidence as a starting point for further investigation. Example, the 1848 Mahele was a tragic historical event, a turning point that had catastrophic negative consequences for Hawaiians. Okay, that's a hypothesis. Well, you're supposed to also apply a theory which is a set of principles on which the practice of an activity is based. Example, the theory of land tenure. Fee simple, and in Hawaiian, it's called makeano alodio, life estates, malalo iho okeano alodio, and leasehold, ho'oli malima. Now, replication is the deliberate repetition of research efforts that is intended to confirm or extend previous findings. Complementarity are the efforts of independent approaches to confirm, overturn, or extend particular research findings. Or there is duplication, which is either the unconscious or deliberate repetition of research efforts that does not confirm or deny conclusions from previous research. Professor Kamele Hiba's research findings. By 1855, the commoner class only received a total of 28,658 acres of land in fee simple, which is less than 1% of the total acreage of Hawaii, which is 4 million acres. Actual findings. Between 1850 and 1860, the commoner class acquired 111,448 acres of land through the Mahele, which is in addition to the 28,658 acres. Cause for the error? Professor Kamelehiva did not use the theory of land tenure. Professor Kamelehiva's conclusions that the Great Mahele oppressed the commoners is a cornerstone of the Hawaiian indigeneity movement. Subsequent academic researchers never bothered to apply replication or comp complementarity research to confirm or overturn her findings. They just, they all just duplicated her findings as the basis to push the fabricated story that the Hawaiian kingdom oppressed its people. 
in his 2002 book, Dismembering Lahui, which is another cornerstone to Hawaiian indigeneity, Professor Osorio wrote, as significant an event as the Mahele has proven to be, historians have seen it as a way of making specific indictments, either of ali'i, the chief of class, or of colonialism. 18 years later, however, he admitted, the Mahele was done to protect the Hoa'aina, the Makainana, the commoner, and this was the most amazing things about the Mahele, and it was something that I didn't really understand when I wrote my book. It was something that really Professor Keanu Sai makes clear to all of us. So the importance of terminology, okay? Let's start off with what is an independent state. It is a country which is defined by international law, a centralized government, citizenry, and borders that has exclusive authority of sovereignty over its territory. Example, the United States of America. A state that is not independent is a political unit within an independent state called a federation. Example, the state of New York that exists within the United States. And then we have a nation, a group of people that has a common ancestry, language, and history. Example, Navajo Nation that exists within the state of New Mexico. Now, a colony is a territory attached to the state with political and economic ties. Colonization is the extension of the state's laws and policies through its citizens over territory that does not belong to another state. And colonialism is the process by which colonies are established under what is called the doctrine of discovery. Indigenous, okay, produced, growing, living, or occurring natively or naturally in a particular region or environment. A native species is indigenous to a given region or ecosystem if its presence in that region is the result of only natural processes with no human intervention. So here we have the term indigenous uses human intervention as a determining point. So obviously indigenous are not applied to humans. Example, here in the Hawaiian Islands, the hapu'u firm. We can only find it here in Hawaii. Now the word Aboriginal, relating to the people who have been in a region from the earliest time, implies having no known other preceding, no known other preceding in occupancy of a particular region. So in Australia, you have Aborigines, but Aborigines is referring to those people as being the original people there before anybody else. They do not call themselves Aborigine. They have a name for themselves in their own language. So the term Aborigine is merely to identify that group of people in Australia that have been there originally or before any other people arrived. Now in the Hawaiian kingdom, in the 1883 will of Bernice Powahi Bishop, who established the Kamehameha schools okay, in 1884, uh, 1887, but this is the will of 1883. She specifically states there that I direct my trustees to invest the remainder of my estate to devote a portion of each year's income to the support and education of orphans, giving preference to Hawaiians of pure or part Aboriginal blood. Notice she didn't say indigenous blood, but Aboriginal blood. And the word Hawaiian is not ethnicity. Hawaiian is a short term for Hawaiian subject. That is the nationality of the Hawaiian kingdom of the 19th century. So you can be Caucasian and be a Hawaiian subject, right? But the monies would be devoted toward Hawaiian subjects of pure or part Aboriginal blood. From a political perspective, the use of the term indigenous is applied to an entity originating in a particular region, such as the indigenous government, as distinguished from an imposed government from another country, especially during occupation or military occupations. And also indigenous language, as distinguished from a language 
introduced later. In her 1999 book from a native daughter, Professor Trask explained, some of us in the Hawaiian nationalist community believe the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples should become a part of the framework within which future analyses, including legal discussions regarding our spe special status, should occur in Hawaii and in the United States. This ushered in academic research to be imbued with an indigenous rights discourse that applies critical race theory, colonial theory, and indigeneity. Academics had duplicated, not replicated, the false findings of Kamehameha and Osorio, and consistently cite these books in their publications. The term indigenous peoples was first introduced in the 1989 International Labor Organization Convention number 169. Peoples in independent nations who are regarded as indigenous on account of their descent from populations which inhabited the country or geographical region to which the country belongs at the time of the conquest or colonization or the establishment of present state boundaries. This distinction between indigenous peoples and the state is nuanced through the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that was pushed by Professor Trask. Hawaiians are not indigenous people, according to Professor Lanzarini from the University of Siena in Italy, who serves on the International Law Association's Committee on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. He says indigenous peoples have an international legal right to negotiate within their state, implying that indigenous peoples are not states of their own, but reside and are entitled to exercise their rights within an existing state. This characterization does not apply to Native Hawaiians as citizens of the Hawaiian kingdom, who rather claim to be a national people under foreign occupation. Other Polynesians that are not indigenous people include Samoa. Samoa became an independent state on January 1st, 1962, but it didn't join the United Nations until 1976. Tonga became a recognized independent state on June 4th, 1970, but didn't join the United Nations until 1999, and Tuvalu. It became an independent state on October 1st, 1978, and it joined the United Nations not until the year 2000. So here's Hawaii. This is the true history. Our history didn't begin in 1898 on the international plane. On the international plane, it began in 1794, where on February 25th of that year, Hawaii became a British protectorate by agreement between Captain Vancouver and King Kamehameha I, and the British ensign was the flag of Hawaii. In 1816, Kamehameha I ordered the formation of the Hawaiian flag that became the national flag of the Hawaiian kingdom. On November 28, 1843, both the British and the French jointly recognized the Hawaiian Kingdom as an independent state. So the Hawaiian Kingdom became the first independent state in Oceania over a century before Samoa, Tonga, and Tuvalu. And then the United States recognized the Hawaiian Kingdom's independence on July 6, 1844. Now, under international law, which is uh, as a consequence of Hawaiian independence, it became a subject of international law. International law discerns and separates between what is called the state, which has the sovereignty, the country, and its government. Because in wars between countries, governments can be overthrown, but the state would continue to exist. And you call that situation occupation. The Hawaiian Kingdom was one of only 44 independent states in the family of nations throughout the 19th century. The Hawaiian Kingdom was a recognized neutral state by treaty, along with Belgium, Luxembourg, and Switzerland. The Hawaiian Kingdom's literacy was second to Scotland, and Aboriginal Hawaiians throughout the islands received universal health care at no cost. 
The Hoang Kingdom even colonized the Northwest Islands under the doctrine of discovery. By 1893, the Hawaiian Kingdom maintained over 90 legations or embassies and consulates worldwide. These are the letterheads that are from the archives. And you notice Hawaiian legation, Washington, D.C. Oh, you maintain an embassy in Washington, D.C., also in London and France. According to Judge Greenwood, traditional international law was based upon a rigid distinction between a state of peace and a state of war. Countries were either in a state of peace or a state of war. There was no intermediate state. And this is important because you have what is called the law of peace and the law of war under international law. Okay? And there are two different regimes of law that would apply. Now, acts of war committed by the military of a country against the, another country, okay, that's what triggers a state of war. So when Russia invaded Ukraine, that act by the Russian military triggered a state of war between Ukraine and Russia. Now, a state of war includes military occupation. On January 16, 1893, the Hawaiian Kingdom was invaded by United States Marines and its government overthrown and replaced by a puppet government the following day calling itself the Provisional Government. Queen Lilith Okalani conditionally surrendered to the United States and called upon the president to investigate the actions taken by U.S. troops and the American ambassador. She did not surrender to the provisional government because they were, they were established by the U.S. ambassador. By direction of Queen Lilith Okalani, President Cleveland on March 11, 1893, initiated a presidential investigation into the overthrow of the Hawaiian government. On December 18, 1893, the president reported to the Congress his findings and conclusions of the investigation. He told the Congress that on the 16th day of January, 1893, between 4 and 5 o'clock in the afternoon, a detachment of Marines from the United States steamer Boston with two pieces of artillery landed at Honolulu. The men, upwards of 160 in all, were supplied with double cartridge belts filled with ammunition and with haversacks and canteens, and were accompanied by a hospital corps with stretchers and medical supplies. He concluded that this military demonstration upon the soil of Honolulu was of itself an act of war. Under international law, a state of war was triggered. President Cleveland also stated that by an act of war with the participation of a diplomatic representative of the United States, and without authority of Congress, the government of a feeble but friendly and confiding people has been overthrown. He also concluded that the provisional government owes its existence to an armed invasion by the United States. These acts of war committed against the Hawaiian Kingdom began the American belligerent occupation on January 17, 1893. Under international law, belligerent occupation means a state does not consent to the occupation. If it did, it would be called a pacific occupation or peaceful occupation, but the laws of war would not apply. Customary international law in 1893 obligated the United States as the occupier to establish a military government and begin to administer the laws of the Hawaiian Kingdom and not the laws of the United States when they are in effective control of the territory. This obligation is now codified under Article 43 of the 1907 Hague Regulations and Article 64 of the 1949 Fourth Geneva Convention. A military government is the civilian government of the occupied state with its head being a general officer called a military governor that has centralized command and control of the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. This civilian government was the governmental infrastructure of the Hawaiian Kingdom on January 17, 1893, which is now the governmental infrastructure of the state of Hawaii. Under international law, the military overthrow of a country's government does not affect the continued existence of the state with its independence and sovereignty. Professor Brownlee explains, after the defeat of Nazi Germany in the Second World War, 
the four major allied powers assumed supreme power in Germany. The legal competence of the German state, its independence and sovereignty did not, however, disappear. What occurred is akin to legal representation or agency of necessity. The German state continued to exist and indeed, the legal basis of the occupation depended on its existence. The very considerable derogation of sovereignty or authority involved in the assumption of powers of government by foreign states without the consent of Germany did not constitute a transfer of sovereignty. So here we have the separation of the Hawaiian state and the government. What occurred in 1893, admitted by President Cleveland, the government was overthrown illegally. But instead of administering the laws of the occupied state, they treated the situation as if the entire country was overthrown, when in fact it wasn't. Only the government, which left the Hawaiian state, still in existence. The U.S. did not establish a military government to administer Hawaiian kingdom law, and instead unilaterally seized the Hawaiian islands in 1898, five years later, during the Spanish-American War, by enacting a congressional law called a Joint Resolution of Annexation. The Congress claimed that the annexation by a congressional joint resolution was a military necessity in order to fight the Spanish in Guam and the Philippines. Congressional laws, however, had no effect beyond the borders of the United States. So the United States could no more pass a law in Congress to annex Canada today than it can pass a law in 1898 annexing the Hawaiian Islands. And this is because the U.S. Supreme Court clearly states that neither the federal constitution nor the congressional laws passed in pursuance of it have any force in foreign territory. And operations of the nation in such territory must be governed by treaties, international understandings and compacts, and the principles of international law. And according to the Handbook of Humanitarian Law and Armed Conflicts, annexation is illegal. What's important to know is annexation is not a process, but rather the outcome of a process. Annexation is by definition an extension, right? You can only acquire territory to have be considered annexed if there was a treaty that transferred that territory called ceded lands, much in the same way as the Louisiana Purchase, which was during a state of peace, or the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo of 1848 that ended the Mexican-American War. Now, the international law of belligerent occupation must therefore be understood as meaning that the occupying power is not sovereign, but exercises provisional and temporary control over foreign territory. The legal situation of the territory can be altered only through a peace treaty. International law does not permit annexation of territory of another state, which is unilateral. There is no peace treaty and the occupation continues now at 131 years. Now, in order to conceal the military occupation of an independent state, the United States deliberately implemented a policy of denationalization through Americanization in 1906. Denationalization, according to international law, is the obliteration of the national consciousness of the occupied state in the minds of school children. In 1919, the United States and the other allied powers of the First World War also determined that denationalization is a war crime. During the First World War, the United States and the allied powers charged that Bulgaria imposed their national characteristics on the Serbian population, banned the Serbian language, People were beaten for saying good morning in Serbia, and the Serbian population forced to be present at Bulgarian national ceremonies. The United Nations War Crimes Commission in Nuremberg to try Nazi war criminals stated, attempts of this nature were recognized as a war crime in view of the German policy in territories annexed by Germany in 1914. At that time, as during the war of 1939 to 1945, inhabitants of an occupied territory were subjected to measures intended to deprive them of their national characteristics and to make the land and population affected 
a German province. Samuel Damon, an insurgent in 1893, stated, if we are ever to have peace and annexation, the first thing to do is to obliterate the past. He was also a trustee of the Kamehameha schools from 1884 until 1909. Denationalization is also a crime against humanity and cultural genocide. In 1905, the American editor of the Pacific Commercial Advertiser newspaper in Honolulu wrote under the heading, the American way. By gradually raising the standard of knowledge of English, the high school has so far changed its color that during the past year, 73% were Caucasians. It is not so many years ago that more than 73% were non-Caucasians. At the present rate of progress, it will not be long before the high school will have its student body as thoroughly Americanized in blood as it long has been in instruction. He also wrote, one great and potent duty of our high schools, public and private, is to conserve the domination here of Anglo-Saxon ideas and institutions. And this means control by white men. In 1906, here's the pamphlet titled Program for Patriotic Exercise in the Public Schools that was published by the government of the Territory of Hawaii. The theme of the program was to indoctrinate the school children of the Hawaiian Islands to be American and to speak English. This program began during the time of my grandparents. Harper's Weekly Magazine traveled to Hawaii and did a story on this denationalization. And they published their story in 1907, titled Hawaii's Lesson to Headstrong California. Here you have six, a picture of 614 school children. They're marching in front of the American flag and at the command of the principal, they stand at attention and they salute. And this is the Betham salute, the civilian salute. And at the command of the principal, they all yell in unison. It says here, we give our heads and our hearts to God and our country. One country, one language, one flag. This scene shows a salute to the American flag, which flies in the grounds of the Kaiolani Public School, which has many Japanese pupils. The drill is constantly held as a means of inculcating patriotism in the hearts of the children. Now, why did they make reference to Japanese? Because the Hawaiian Islands were taken by the United States military in order to establish it as a military outpost to protect the west coast of the United States from invasion by Japan. British novelist Dresden James wrote, when a well-packaged web of lies has been sold gradually to the masses over generations, the truth will seem utterly preposterous and its speaker a raving lunatic. So, how do you deal with this problem? Well, I call it a military approach to a military occupation. What I have is 10 years of experience as a field artillery officer from 1984 to 1994. And we're trained very well in battle planning. I basically applied my experience and my training as an army officer to address this situation of Hawaii's occupation and brainwashing. In the battle planning training, we, we, we've been trained to do what has been come to be known as the command estimate process, which is to frame a suit suitable operational plan. The military commander must make an estimate of the situation. An estimate of the situation involves a careful consideration of all the circumstances affecting the problem. In making this estimate, he considers his mission, all available information of the opposing force, conditions affecting his own command, and the terrain insofar as it affects the situation. The terrain here is public international law. For over a century, the United States has not complied with international humanitarian law, also called the law of armed conflict in the military, in its prolonged occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Compliance with the law of armed conflict will bring the prolonged occupation to an end. So therefore, this mission was created. 
through all legal means, compel the United States and the state of Hawaii to begin to comply with international humanitarian law and the law of occupation. First, the government must be restored. According to Professor Rim, the state continues to exist even in the factual absence of government so long as the people entitled to reconstruct the government remain. And this is focused on the nationals of a particular country, in this case, Hawaiian subjects, which is multi-ethnic, not native oriented. The majority of the Hawaiian national population are Aboriginal Hawaiians, in fact, 86%, right? But it was also multi-ethnic because it included others that weren't Aboriginal. On February 28, 1997, myself and other Hawaiian subjects exercised their right of internal self-determination and took the necessary steps to restore the Hawaiian Kingdom government as a regency under the doctrine of necessity and Hawaiian constitutional law. A regency serves in the absence of a monarch. It is not a monarch. Addressing over a century of occupation, the Hawaiian Council of Regency was formed similar to the formation of governments in exile during the Second World War under the doctrine of necessity. In particular, the Hawaiian Council of Regency was established in similar fashion to the Belgian Council of Regency after King Leopold was captured by the Nazis in World War II. As the Belgian Council of Regency was established under Article 82 of its constitution, the Hawaiian Council of Regency was established under Article 33 of the Hawaiian Constitution. Council of Regency established a three-phase operational plan. Phase one, verification of the Hawaiian Kingdom as an independent state and subject of international law. This is where a reputable international body must verify the continued existence of the Hawaiian Kingdom as a state. It's crucial, very crucial and critical in order to move to phase two. Once verification occurs, then phase two is exposure. Exposure of Hawaiian statehood within the framework of international law and the law of occupation at its effects the realm of politics and economics at both the international and domestic levels. Phase two will focus on individual accountability and compliance to the law of occupation. Phase two is gonna be uncomfortable because people will be forced to face the facts and the truth. This will eventually move to phase three, restoration, which is when the occupation will come to an end. Well, phase one was completed at the Permanent Court of Arbitration in the Netherlands. They verified that the Hawaiian Kingdom continues to exist as a state. The Permanent Court of Arbitration is an intergovernmental organization that creates ad hoc tribunals to resolve international disputes. In order for it to be an international dispute, one of the parties has to be a state, a state. So the PCA has what is called institutional jurisdiction for the following disputes. A dispute between two states. Here we have a dispute between Ecuador and the United States of America over a treaty interpretation that started at the Permanent Court of Arbitration in 2011. And here you notice in this case repository of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, they identified Ecuador as a state, the United States as a state. Then they went ahead and formed the tribunal to resolve the dispute. Next is a dispute between a state and an international organization. Here we have Peru, versus the United Nations Office of, for Project Services. Here they identify Peru as a state and the UN as an international organization. They can also resolve disputes between a state and a private party. Here is Larson versus the Hawaiian Kingdom that was initiated in 1999 and it ended in 2001. I served as the lead agent for the legal team of this, for this case. In the case description, it says here, Lance Paul Larson, a resident of Hawaii, brought a claim against the Hawaiian Kingdom by its Council of Regency on the grounds that the government of the Hawaiian Kingdom is in continual violation of its 1849 Treaty of Friendship, Commerce, and Navigation with the United States of America, as well as the principles of international law laid down in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties of 1969 and the principles of international comity for allowing 
the unlawful imposition of American municipal laws over him within the territorial jurisdiction of the Hawaiian kingdom. So this dispute was a tort. He was trying to seek accountability by claiming the council of regency, the government, was liable for his rights being violated by the United States in an unfair trial, which led to his incarceration in prison. Now, the Permanent Court of Arbitration, before they could form the tribunal, had to verify the Hawaiian Kingdom was, or is, or continues to be, a state. So here they identify Lance Paul Larson as a private entity, and the Hawaiian Kingdom, a state. They also, in these proceedings, confirm and verify that the Council of Regency is the government of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Phase two initiated exposure of the Hawaiian Kingdom as a state during oral hearings at the Permanent Court of Arbitration on December 7, 8, and 11. The Dominion of the Hawaiian Kingdom. In summary, from 1840, the Hawaiian Kingdom possessed a constitutional government with elected and appointed officials and a complete system of civil and criminal laws to govern Hawaiian territory. On April 8, 1842, King Commander III and Privy Council commissions three envoys to secure international recognition of Hawaiian independence. And these individuals are Kimoteo Ha'alilio, William Richards, and Sir George Simpson. On December 19, 1842, Hawaiian envoys secured the United States President Tyler's recognition of Hawaiian independence. November 28, 1843, the British government and the French government formally enter into a declaration recognizing Hawaiian independence. In our pleadings, we refer to that as the 1843 Anglo-Franco Proclamation. From that point, Hawaii has had its statehood recognized as being independent. As such, it began to enter into these treaties, Austria-Hungary, Denmark, France, Germany, Great Britain, Italy, Japan, Netherlands, Russia, Spain, and the United States of America. International recognition is evidence that the Hawaiian Kingdom had diplomatic representatives as of 1893 from those countries, as far as consulates and embassies. Rather, what we find is that the United States has never expressed, it, expressed itself as an occupier. Who would? They will never admit to occupation. But yet, to admit to occupation is, in a sense, to admit to the continued existence of the Hawaiian Kingdom as an independent state, which is really the crux of the matter which is actually what is holding up, you might say, this issue to be resolved. Thus, the legal order. Thus, the reestablishment of the government. Thus, the relationship between its nationals. I, I mean, to be, to be slightly unkind, but thus the issue in REM. The point is that if the Hawaiian kingdom continues to exist, its existence is in REM. It's not in personam of the Hawaiian existence. The, the Hawaiian kingdom doesn't exist solely in the opinion of Mr. Larson. Right. But that existence should not be dependent upon an occupier because you basically put the occupier at an, on an equal footing with the Hawaiian kingdom in its own territory. So really what needs to be addressed is what came before the occupation, whether the statehood or whether the legality or the illegality of the Hawaiian Kingdom, not the illegality or legality of the United States as an occupier. Should the tribunal find it has jurisdiction, we are prepared to submit an offer of proof. We felt that this tribunal would offer some clarity so that for the first time we have a third party to present these type of merits that can be scrutinized by international law, rather than taking it before a United States tribunal which could not rule on it to the detriment of itself. So in that sense, there is really no other way to address this issue. And the opportunity did arise because it was Mr. Larson who was adhering to Hawaiian Kingdom law. And if the United States was adhering to that situation, not whether they're illegal or illegal, 
But if they were adhering to the laws of occupation, we wouldn't be here right now. So yes, that was me with a lot more hair. <laughs> now, after the oral hearings were held at the Permanent Court of Arbitration in the Netherlands, the Council of Regency was called to a meeting by Rwandan Ambassador Dr. Bill Zagara in the city of Brussels, Belgium, on December 11, 2000. He was at the Permanent Court of Arbitration the previous Friday, and his government became aware of the Hawaiian Kingdom case. At this meeting, he said his government has offered to the Council of Regency to report to the United Nations General Assembly by placing it on the agenda for prolonged occupation. After careful consideration, however, the Council thanked the Ambassador for Rwanda's offer, but it could not accept the offer in good conscience because it needed to address the devastating effects of denationalization first. Here we are in The Hague in the Netherlands, and people back home have no clue of Hawaii's profound status as an occupied state. So we had to address that. So we looked at the law of land warfare, which is gonna guide us. This is US Army Field Manual 27-10. Remedies for violations of international law, war crimes. In the event of violation of the law of war, the injured party may legally resort to remedial action of the following types. We are going to select this type of action. Publication of the facts with a view to influencing public opinion against the offending belligerent. Since returning from the Netherlands in 2000, the Council of Regency addressed the devastating effects of the war crime of denationalization by having me enter the University of Hawaii Political Science Department graduate program to acquire a master's degree and a PhD degree specializing in international relations and law with research focus on the Hawaiian kingdom and the occupation. It is in the university system worldwide where we will institutionalize, not politicize, the Hawaiian kingdom's continued existence through international law. In 2003, the Hawaiian Society of Law and Politics was established at the University of Hawaii that encouraged multidisciplinary research on the subject of the Hawaiian Kingdom and the American occupation. As a result, multiple articles, peer review, law review, master's theses, doctor dissertations, and publications began to be uh, 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 published. And uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And we're talking about internationally as well, not just here in Hawaii. And this here is an article that was written in a Japanese journal. This is not America. The acting government of the Hawaiian kingdom goes global with legal challenges to end occupation. Uh, this book is my doctor dissertation turned into a history book. It is now used in high schools and middle schools and classes in uh, entry college level. Another book, Come on a Beamer, Nation Within, Tom Kaufman, Lawrence Gunsher, Power in the World, The Hawaiian Kingdom. This is a book that I edited, Royal Commission of Inquiry, Investigating War Crimes and Human Rights Violations Committed in the Hawaiian Kingdom. And here's my latest uh, uh, publication that will be coming out of Oxford University Press this summer, and it's a chapter titled Hawaii Sovereignty and Survival in the Age of Empire. It's going to be published in a book titled Unconquered States, Non-European Powers in the Imperial Age. This teaching that we've done at the university has affected many school teachers who are getting their certificates at the University of Hawaii. Well, in 2017, the Hawaii State Teachers Association, which is an affiliate uh, uh, member of the National Education Association Union, the largest union of public school teachers and, uh, and, and administrators across the United States, they were able to get the NEA at its annual conference in Boston in 2017 to pass this resolution, stating the NEA will publish an article that documents the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy in 1893 the prolonged illegal occupation of the United States in the Hawaiian kingdom and the harmful effects that this occupation has had on the Hawaiian people and resources of the land. 
when the delegates got back from uh, Boston, they reached out to me and they asked if I could write those articles for them to be published or if I could write those articles to be published on the NEA website. And that first article was published on April 2nd, 2018, titled The Illegal Overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom Government. Not just the Hawaiian Kingdom, because the government was overthrown, not the country. And then that was followed by another article, The U.S. Occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom, and then the impact of the U.S. Occupation on the Hawaiian people. The record is set. Occupation is not a perspective but rather a set of facts interpreted through the lens of state theory. The Hawaiian Islands were never a colony of the United States since 1898. Aboriginal Hawaiians are not an indigenous people or tribal nation within the United States. Rather, Aboriginal Hawaiians are the majority of the national population of the Hawaiian Kingdom called Hawaiian subjects. And this is not the 50th state of the United States, but rather an occupied state called the Hawaiian Kingdom. And uh, with that, I would like to turn it back over to uh, Dietrich. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Sai. Um, the information that you provided was enlightening, um, and it was definitely it will definitely help us um, to enter the space um, as we come to the conference with more understanding um, and a better insight into the struggle um, of the Hawaiian people. So at this time, we'd like to open it up for any questions or inquiries that you have um, of Dr. Sai. If you can put your questions into the chat or the Q&A function of Zoom, um, we'll go through them as they come in. Don't be shy. Hmm. So, I have a question. Um, what you transitioned from military to academia? Um, what was the thought process with that? I I, I kind of uh, get an understanding of that um, looking at the work that you do um, and the the way that in which you presented it. Um, but I'd like to hear from you. What really kind of spurred? Was there a moment? Was there a particular event or a reading that kind of sparked that intrigue? Sure. No, um, I did not choose this route. <laughs> it was the route or the path chose me. <laughs> hey, for so many of us, right? Yeah, no, exactly. So after I graduated from the Kamehameha Schools, which was established in 1887, for Aboriginal Hawaiians to attend, preference for Aboriginal Hawaiians. I went on to a military college, New Mexico Military Institute, where I got my commission as a second lieutenant, okay? And it was part of the early commissioning program. So they slammed four years of military science into two years because they needed officers, right? So I, I was about to graduate in 1984 uh, with my associate's degree in pre-business and uh, my commission as a second lieutenant. Uh, I got a call from my mom who says my grandmother, which we say in Hawaiian, tutu, my tutu uh, was in hospice at my uncle's house next door and she had cancer. And I'm the oldest grandchild in this family. So Hawaiian custom is the oldest grandchild is always the closest to the grandparents. They become their favorite. So I was raised by both my parents and my tutu, right? And we all live close together in a valley called Kuli O'o. Now, um, my mom conveyed to me what my tutu told her to tell me, what she said, that I will not pass away until you come home. So I came home, and uh, all my tutu wanted me to do was just sit down next to her, to her hospice bed, by myself. She wouldn't let anybody in the room. I had to make sure the door was closed and my uncles and aunties and cousins were outside and my tutu would just share stories with me. And it was like my tutu was reliving the stories of her childhood. Almost like eight years old, she's talking like she's eight years old, like she's re-experiencing it, right? And 
so many stories that were were being shared with me, I was taken aback. I was like, this is not the tutu I knew. My tutu was a very devout Catholic. She played the organ in the Hawaiian Mass at Holy Trinity. My tutus, my, my grandfather passed away when my mom was only like 12 years old. So my tutu had to raise nine children on her own, right? So when she's telling me these stories, I was taken aback. One particular story that stood out for me was she said that she was very concerned for Uncle Paneco, who I knew was my older uncle that would visit, but he was a young child at the, in, the, in this storytelling. Mm -hmm. And she tells me that she was concerned for Uncle Paneco because he got spankings for not properly bowing before the prince in the house. And I went, Tutu, who's the prince? <laughs> Do we have an uncle named Prince? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, Prince Kuhio. And I went, what? Now, Prince Kuhio was a real prince from the kingdom era under King Kalakaua and Lilit Wokalani. And he later served in as a representative in Congress. And his name was Prince Kuhio, Kalani Anaole. And I went, Prince Kuhio is in the house? And she tells me, he's good He's good friends with my dad. I was like, what? <laughs> I had no idea. Wow. So all these stories just started to just flow, and I'm just sitting back, just overwhelmed, right? Well, my tutu was in hospice for about three months. And before she passed, I believe she passed in December of 1984, she told me, Keanu, promise me that you will know your genealogy. I said, okay. She said, no, promise me. And I said, okay, I will. So she passed, but I didn't take her up on knowing my genealogy until 1992 because I was focusing on my military, right? My contract. Now, uh, 1992, I realized, oh my God, I didn't follow through with my tutus Kauoha, as we say in Hawaiian, order, right? It was, yeah. it was an order. Yeah. So the first thing I did was uh, I went to the archives just behind Iolani Palace, all archival records. And I was told that they help Hawaiians do genealogy. I said, oh, okay, that's the place to start. So I went there and I asked the archivist, how do I, do, how do I start my genealogy? I had no clue, right? She said, why don't you go to that bookshelf and pull up this book, Hawaiian Genealogies. Oh, wow. And these are reprints of genealogies from Hawaiian Kingdom newspapers. Wow. So I went to the index and I looked up my tutu's maiden name. And her maiden name is Symerson, which is an uncommon name, Symerson. And then I find Symerson page 56. <laughs> so I went to page 56 and I find the article, uh, the genealogy that was published in the Kamakainana newspaper. It's all in Hawaiian. Uh -huh. And it's titled Mo'okuo Hawali'i Genealogy of Nobility. Wow. And it started off in the 1400s King Lilo of Hawaii Island, all the way to my great grandfather in 1896 when he was 16 years old, William Kuakini Simerson. I went, wow. <laughs> so that's what got me just to dive into the records. I wanted to know where they lived. Mm -hmm. Where did my grand my great grandfather work? Mm -hmm. I wanted to understand the ancient chiefs. I, I had a it was an all personal connection, mm -hmm. right? So what happened was I wanted to find a connection with Prince Kuhio. Then I looked in a newspaper for his state funeral in 1922. They listed the 14 pallbearers of his casket. And they identified the 14 pallbearers as the 14 high-ranking chiefs of the Hawaiian kingdom. He was one of them, my great-grandfather. Then I also found he was one of the 14 pallbearers of Queen Lili Okalani's coffin in her state funeral and to be close to the to, to the monarch the coffin you had to have high rank and that everything just started to click 
right? Mm -hmm. And then I naturally get into 1893 because I'm just trying to find out what's going on. And something resonated with me with regard to the overthrow. Two years before, in 1990, I was going to officer's advance course at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, as an army captain, field artillery captain. Mm -hmm. That's the first Gulf War when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. We're getting live intel coming in, and we're actually using that intel to develop battle plans because at any time we could be activated. And the one thing that, that we all knew back then was even though Saddam Hussein overthrew the Kuwaiti government and drove them into exile into Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait was still Kuwait. Nothing yeah. happened to Kuwait as a country. Yeah. And then after the overthrow, Saddam Hussein from Baghdad declares under Iraqi law, Kuwait is the 19th province of Baghdad. It was annexed. That didn't change anything. Kuwait was still Kuwait. Yeah. Our job was to expel the Iraqis. And that's what that was my aha moment. And I went, wait a minute. 1893 was only the overthrow of the government, not the country. How did the United States acquire Hawaii? The same way Saddam Hussein did, the country still exists. And that was, that's when I came to the realization in 1994, I was a battery commander, a captain in charge. Of, my command was Charlie Battery, 1st of the 487 Field Artillery, 105 howitzers. And I knew I had to leave. So I had already fulfilled my contract, three years active duty, three years reserve as a commission officer. And I had six additional, four additional years voluntary. And I liked it. But I met yeah. with my battalion commander and I said, sir, I think it's time for me to leave. So I was army discharged. And that's when I began this process. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So it's not that I chose it, but it chose me. Yeah. And I couldn't deny my, my, my family tie. And I'm directly tied to it. So I, I had that military, I had that military training and I had no animosity for the American military. Well, I was, I was a mercenary. Mm -hmm. And very well trained. So it was cool. You know, I, I liked it. And a lot of Hawaiians serve in the military. Right. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, my son uh, joined the same Army National Guard unit that I was in. And he served uh, nine months in Afghanistan in Jalalabad as a battlefield NCO, non commissioned officer. You know, so being a warrior is something inherent in Polynesians, <laughs> whether Samoan, Tongan, Hawaiians. Mm -hmm. We fit in it because. What what Polynesians and especially Hawaiians do in the military, a military structure, it's it's it that structure allows uh, a place of, to know where you sit and where you fit and how you excel. Hawaiians yeah. have always excelled in the military, not because they want to be an American, but they want to be a soldier. Yeah. And that's why I took it. That's where I came. Yeah. So I guess uh, whether I knew it or not. My ancestors and my 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 tutu and them were were preparing me <laughs> to do what I'm supposed to do, which I didn't yeah. know until I did it. <laughs> yeah, and I think what's beautiful about that is it makes me um, harken back to like the feminist theory where the personal becomes the political and the political becomes personal, right? Um, it wasn't it it wasn't until um, you heard such like raw and un unfiltered stories from your tutu that the the kind of pieces started to fall into place and everything that you've ever gone through led you to this very moment yeah yeah it's beautiful um we did have some questions come in we had an anonymous attendee ask what is your timeline for completing the publicizing of the facts and how would you know when this is accomplished Okay, so phase two is exposure, right? So when we started the exposure, remember we're starting from, from, from teaching people at the university something so foreign that the Hawaiian Kingdom is its own country. So we had to start off with the state, and to explain the state in the academy is to apply state theory. Okay, and then international law, international relations. So we're not only teaching. Uh, uh, the facts of history, but apply the appropriate theoretical framework. So you cannot use colonial theory to explain the state, because in colonial theory, the state is the oppressor, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So you have to use state theory. And that's, that, that, that's what we started with, that exposure at the university level. 
And then it leads to peer review articles, law review articles, master's theses, doctor dissertations, publications. So it's basically a scaffolding, right? But eventually, we have to bring compliance to the law of occupation. And compliance is not going to take place in the university system. That is just research. That is publication. That is awareness. So we've been also making arguments in the courts in Hawaii in proving the Hawaiian kingdom exists. Therefore, you don't exist and you don't have jurisdiction. And if mm. you proceed, knowing that, that's a war crime. See, now we're able to say war crime because there is a basis to explain it, which is already covered in academic literature, right? This is not a political statement. I'm saying it's a war crime. No, mm. when you say a war crime, you better be correct. It's like pulling out <laughs> a yeah. better be prepared to pull the trigger, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that has led to uh, education outside of the university system where we are currently in uh, negotiations with senior leadership of the state of Hawaii to transform itself into a military government, which the United States was supposed to have done in 1893 in order to begin to comply with the law of occupation and eventually bring the occupation to an end. And at every step, it's giving like the leadership of the state of Hawaii the opportunity to do their due diligence and refute this information. If you can't, then it triggers the law of occupation and the establishment of a military government. So that is actually taking place right now. In fact, um, just yesterday, I gave an update on uh, the status of Hawaii under international law with regard to war crimes, the formation of a government, military government to the Maui County Council. That's the legislative branch of the Council of Ma uh, in Maui. And uh, they were shocked. They saw it. And these are the kind of things that we do outside of the university system where I got to put my hat on called the head of the Royal Commission of Inquiry. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and then when I get back to UH and I teach my class, I take that hat off and I put senior lecture hat on. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of different hats. Yeah, yeah, many different hats. Um, so we have a question from um, Melina Melina, Melina Dennis, um, what is the current state of legal challenges to the occupation of Hawaii? There are no legal challenges because it's indisputable. The permanent court of arbitration already verified the Hawaiian kingdom still exists. That's not a dispute. That's an acknowledgement of a, of a fact. It's, it's referred to in the civil law tradition, a juridical fact or a legal fact, okay, which has consequences. Now, the one thing that international law brings into the fold with regard to a country and its continued existence, despite its government being overthrown. It's called the presumption of continuity. That's an international principle. So the presumption, not the assumption, the presumption of continuity of a state, despite its government being militarily overthrown is a principle of law, right? So what that means is a presumption is an established fact where the burden of proof to prove otherwise is on someone else. So like the presumption of innocence is the, the alleged criminal doesn't have to prove they're innocent. They are presumed to be innocent. It is up to the prosecutor to show they're not with yeah. overwhelming evidence. So it, the, the presumption shifts the burden. Okay, mm -hmm. Under international law, the presumption of continuity of a state means that the Hawaiian kingdom does not have to prove it still exists. All we have to show that it did exist. You got a show called the United States that it doesn't exist. Oh, yes. That is what is called rebuttable evidence. At the Permanent Court of Arbitration, the United States did not contest the decision made by the Permanent Court of Arbitration because they couldn't. <laughs> Unless they can show that there's a treaty that Hawaii became a part of the United States, like the Louisiana Purchase or the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, right? We have none. All we have are American laws being imposed in a foreign country, and the people of Hawaii have been led to believe that this is the United States. It's just a lie. Mm. And the law cuts right through it. So that's why there is no dispute. There's no challenges. The only thing that we have is people don't know. <laughs> so that goes back to the exposure. And that's why education is very important. 
but it's also the unconventional means, unconventional means of education, as well as the conventional. And, and that's what is important. So I'm I'm a very I'm a firm believer in education. And the fact that they took over our educational system, the administration of the United States in 1906, mm -hmm. shows the power of education where they weaponized it. Yes. They weaponized yes. it. Well, we're not going to weaponize education here. We're going to utilize it because education is key to understanding a situation, meaning mm -hmm. knowledge is power. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That makes complete sense. Um, and thank you for explaining that so um, eloquently and easily attainable, right? Because um, when you, especially when you think about law, then you think about international law, it could be cumbersome, right? And so it, the way in which you explain kind of the process um, and also providing the education makes it attainable to just a person just perusing our looking online or attending a workshop like today. So thank you for that. We had another question come in. Um, it says, thank you, Dr. Sai, for your presentation as well as access to your publication. As in-core attendees, how can we enter Hawaii and be intentional and respectful to the status of, Hawaiian, of the Hawaiian kingdom and the people? What else can we share with our students as we prepare for the conference? Well, it would be good to show, uh, well, articles on the topic, um, just to prepare them. Now, it, it, I'm a firm believer in, if you're gonna do something, be prepared for it. But if you're gonna know something, be prepared as well. So so I would, like, I would, like, I, I would say this, um, the 38th parallel, in, in Korea, separating north from the south. If an American soldier actually crosses the parallel into North Korea, the first thing you do is don't jump up and down and yell, I'm an American. It's called blend in. <laughs> Just blend in, right? Yeah. And wait till some guys can get you, right? What we have in Hawaii is don't draw attention to it. Just blend in and watch see observe you know uh compare and contrast but prepare your students when they come to hawaii on what they will see you got those who believe in indigenous that native hawaiians are similar to native americans which has been completely falsified and you got those that know that hawaii is a country being occupied not that you engage the conversation because they're mutually exclusive mm -hmm. but at least you can see the the, the contrast, because we're looking at 131 years of brainwashing, where the Germans during World War II only denational attempt to denationalize in four years. Hawaii is now at 131, meaning wow. it's been institutionalized. It's deep. It's like the movie The Matrix in a sci-fi movie. Yeah. And the only way that you can see the matrix, you have to get unplugged. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. only way you can get unplugged, you got to take the red pill. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's called education. You, by, by becoming aware, you've taken that pill. Now, what people may not know is uh, Neil in uh, the matrix, matrix one, Keanu Reeves, that's actually my cousin. So we're the same age. Yeah. We were named after my grandfather, Henry Keanu Reeves. My mom is a Reeves, right? Keanu's wow. dad is Hawaiian. Keanu's dad is Hawaiian. <laughs> so, so what we have here in Hawaii is the real matrix, not the sci-fi matrix. <laughs> and yeah, and and uh, I'm the real Neil, right? And then my yeah. tutu, and my tutu is Morpheus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yes. So, but, so, so, so the audience here can actually Google Jimmy Kimmel live, right? So Jimmy Kimmel was interviewing Keanu, my cousin, mm -hmm. when he was promoting uh, the movie John Wick, and he turned 50 years old. And if you Google that, he asked certain questions. And one of the questions that Jimmy Kimmel asked Keanu was, you know, that name Keanu, I've never heard of it before. Have you ever met another Keanu? 
And he goes, yeah, I got a cousin. <laughs> and he goes, you got a cousin? And then uh, Keanu goes, I'm Hawaiian. We got cousins. And <laughs> then he explained the first time we met, when he came to Hawaii, him and his sister, from mm -hmm. Canada, because that's where he was living at that time. His mom was Canadian. And it, it was pretty funny. Yeah. 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 That's it's, that's amazing. <laughs> that's so cool. Um, any other questions that you all have? Um, so yes, you do have access to um, Dr. Sai's article also, and um, kind of um, on the same line of how you can prepare your students is this will be accessible on YouTube, on the YouTube channel. Um, also, one thing that you introduced me to um, is the Hawaiian Kingdom Academia channel um, on YouTube. And so, yeah, being able to direct them towards those places um, so that your students could kind of maybe um, view that on their own, or you could have like a group viewing or something like that. I think um, that would be beneficial because um, like has been so, um, so excellently reinforced is that education is how you do it, right? Education is how you um, challenge the status quo because the more people who know and the more people who are aware um, and have awareness of this, um, the more movement we can have. So, you know, yes. Dietrich, if I can also say that uh, the audience can ask, can access the NEA articles, National Education Association, by just typing in Google, NEA, and I'll take you to those three articles so they can get access to it. Um, you can also get more of my publications at my University of Hawaii website. So my University of Hawaii website, again, Google it, just say Dr. Keanu Sai, and then it'll take you directly to the first link. It, it'll be my UH website and go to publications and it's all there. Yeah. Great. And that is now in the chat for everyone. So um, I just want to say again how grateful and excited um, that we were able to have this first um, part introductory webinar series for setting our compass um, and coming to Hawaii. And um, I want to say less than 90 days. Um, like we'll be there in a few months. And so thank you for your insight and your knowledge and your expertise um, in providing this content um, so that we can be as respectful um, and be as um, insightful as we possibly can as we enter that space with you all. And I'll also be uh, presenting at the conference as well. Yes, yes, yeah. well, yes. Um, so thank you. Um, have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Sai, and we will see you on the 21st um, with the development of the pledge to our K key. Awesome. Okay, have a good aloha. weekend. Aloha. Aloha. Mm -hmm.